good. Good to see that we have a okay-ish full house somehow. I'm the host of today's session. My name is Michael Brenzel and it's a pleasure to have you here today discussing the digital transformation in the workplace. Before we begin, just some notes. We will have uh, at the end the chance to uh, get questions so that you can really also ask me, the panelists, uh, any questions that might come up during today. And as well, the session is recorded and can be replayed digitally later in the next couple of days. So now let's jump into welcoming the, my guests of today's session, starting with uh, Talida Franco from Grupo Boticario. Please welcome Talida up on stage. Just take a seat. The second guest we have is uh, Chrissa Stevens from Common Spirit Health. Welcome, Chrissa. And, of course, David uh, Johnson, Chief Data Officer from Forbes Media. Welcome on stage as well. Thanks. Good. So before we jump into the topic, maybe you can say a few words about where you're based, where you're coming from. Also, uh, as an international company, also maybe say wh where the company is located or headquartered, uh, so that we know a bit more about yourself and what you do in your role before we jump into the topic. For sure. Well, thank you so much, Michael. It's such an honor to be here. So Grupo Boticario is a Brazilian cosmetics company. So we make perfume, makeup, lotions. Um, based in Brazil, it's almost 50 years old. Um, and currently one of the, the largest beauty franchiser in the world um, and the largest beauty company in Brazil. So it's kind of what we do. And then I run two big teams, which is our tech team for collaboration. So that's where Google Workspace comes in and also our culture team. So two of my favorite topics in this session. Okay, thanks a lot. Krisa. Sure. I work for Common Spirit Health, which is a large healthcare organization. We're one of the largest nonprofit healthcare organizations um, in the country. And we are based out of Chicago. I myself live in the Denver, Colorado area. And my role as a senior product manager is really to help our um, end users adopt and utilize Google Workspace and other digital products more effectively. Thank you. And David. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, so I'm David Johnson. I'm a Chief Data Officer at Forbes Media. Been there for a little over five years now. Uh, I'm responsible for um, our, our insights team, or the traditional BI team, uh, data products team, the data science team, and the data engineering team. And um, Forbes is a New York-based organization, and I live in Brooklyn. So, Thank you. Good, so agenda-wise, as I said, we have this short uh, introduction done. Uh, we will discuss now the cultural transformation topic, uh, following then with the Q&A, uh, and also maybe share what's next so that you can have some takeaways from today's session. Now, let's move into the first uh, question and topic uh, that we want to address today. So first, we want to discuss really the, let's say, the aha moments that uh, happen in organization when you have digital transformation topics and projects going around. So maybe we start with you, uh, Talita, first. What can you share, have you learned when it comes to uh, aha moments in digital transformation projects? Tough question, um, and I thought a lot about this question, um, trying to pin it back if there was an aha moment. Um, and what I think about transformation is there usually isn't one, there are several, right? And the, the primary reason is why, why do you wanna transform in the first place? What problem are you really trying to solve with the transformation that you're driving? And so in our case, it was fast growth. So um, company that tripled in size in, in about two or three years, um, a change of strategy. So we realized that we needed to stop outsourcing all of our tech and build things in house. Um, and that changes the way that people operate, right? Um, and then third was we redesigned the company to stop looking at brands segmented by brand and look at a customer journey. And so when you have these three, three things together, you need people to collaborate more, right? You need people to talk more, you need people to 
um, gather around a common objective. And so that was from a cultural perspective, but then tools drive culture. And so we said, okay, well, what tools can we put in place to help drive this behavior that we want? And that's when our decision for um, going to Google Workspace and GCP and, and a lot of Google products that we use came from. So this drive to really use tools as a way to um, foster this collaboration that we needed because of these structural changes. So it, it wasn't an aha moment. I, I tried to think of a funny story to tell you, but I couldn't think of one. So <laughs> just it was more of a journey. Yeah. Well, I like the quote that tools drive culture. I think that's a, that's a good, important statement because that's one of the questions we often have when we discuss these topics. What impact are tools really having? And if you say it's driving culture, I think that's a good, good point. Chrisa, what would you share here on this question? Yeah, I'll tag on the idea of tools driving culture. So in 2019, two large healthcare companies merged to create Common Spirit Help. And when each of those legacy companies had active merger and acquisitions department. So by the time they merged, we were on multiple email um, system, multiple email tenants, multiple messaging systems, um, no calendar interop. It's impossible to get an organization to see themselves as one organization after a merger when they can't even see each other's calendar, can't email the same tenant, can't message. So a big aha moment is just getting everyone on one platform. Yeah. So when I'm trying to schedule a meeting, I can see your calendar and actually schedule a meeting. I don't have to email back and forth. We couldn't even message because we were on different messaging tenants. So that was a big thing. So to drive that culture of we are now one organization, we needed to be on one platform. And we were able to do that with Google from contract to getting 165,000 people up in eight months, which was critical to drive that culture of, of us as one organization. So you built the, 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 the basic fundament, let's say, to, to make this a success or even to, yeah, to allow people to communicate with each other, simply said. At a very basic level. And then you add on top of that the collaboration that Toya mentioned. Um, I mean, that just takes you to the next level, right? But at a very basic, you have to at least be on one tenant to communicate. Of course. Yeah. So, yeah. David, what can you share from your side here? Um, well, there, there wasn't just one aha. I would say it's a, it's a proliferate of, uh, of aha moments there. The, the couple of things that I would say are, are relevant is that it's, it's first important to understand all your stakeholders' needs and goals and aspirations and challenges and to, to not just recognize them, but to make them your own challenges as well, to bring that onto your team. So as part of our OKR metrics, we're big into metrics and tracking. We, we bring our partners' goals on, and so we make their success part of our success, and vice versa. Um, the other thing is, is you know, our team is responsible for the centralization of all the data in our ecosystem. And so in order for us to empower um, our stakeholders, we need to make that accessible. And coming up with... Um, uh, a diverse way of delivering that data is, is really crucial. So if we have partners that want to use a BI dashboard, we make that accessible, but we have a lot of partners that want to really roll up their sleeves and, and play with the data. And something like Google Sheets has been super helpful for us in that regard with direct connectivity into our data warehouse, BigQuery, uh, as well as um, uh, you know, bringing those sheets in, or bringing the uh, Google, uh, Google Sheets into Google Slides. Yeah. Um, it, that's been super helpful for us to maintain that accuracy of data, that trust in, in the data, and then uh, the easy accessibility into uh, the mediums that they want to play and interact with the data. Oh, great to hear. Yeah. Then let's see what, what else we have in mind. So um, when we look into the goals of the transformation, what role does technology play for you? Let's start with you, Tanita, here on this question. Um, <clears throat> what role doesn't it play, I think? Um, Hopefully an important one. An important one, an important one. Um, I think for us, we can really say it was critical um, in so much as we actually have uh, our culture team and a part of our technology team under the same person. So I manage both teams. And so we don't think of those things as separate at all. We think of them one driving the other. And I think at the end of the day, people, when you're looking at 
corporate functions, people spend all of their day working in front of a computer, sending emails, making, making slides, making uh, sheets. And so the power that those tools that they use every day has on making their work better or not, and how that translates into culture, I think is really, is really powerful and really um, impactful in, in so many ways. And I think to your point, it's, you know, what, how do you engage your stakeholders so you're actually solving one of their problems instead of just saying, oh, I'm going from tool A to tool B. What is that going, how is that gonna make my life better than it already is? Um, and that's different for everyone, right? And so I think, you know, when you start, I think the, the most bottom layer is communication. You can't have culture if you don't have communication. And then the second one is collaboration. And now we're going to a third step, and this is recent for us, where collaboration is great, but now I need product activity, right, on top of that. So um, in terms of that journey that the tools that you have create and foster the behaviors that you want. Yeah, yeah agreed. That's a very important point for sure. Marissa. When I think about cultural transformation, I think about three different elements, the mind, the heart, and the skill set. And I think technology is where that skill set comes in, um, whether you're working on communication, collaboration, those are the technology tools that really help with that. Um, so for our cultural transformation, again, trying to get two large organizations to see themselves as one, to buy into that concept of being one, to collaborate effectively, to try to standardize where it makes sense as a big um, initiative in healthcare is to standardize, to do things um, according to best practice. So being able to more easily communicate, more easily collaborate, to share policies and procedures or best practices in an asynchronous way because we're across the country, so multiple time zones. Uh, it's, a, it's just important to have that technology. You can't do that without technology, to your point. Um, you need to be able to communicate, but you need to be able to collaborate. And I think that that's what Google allowed us to do is get, again, that buy-in of one organization using the technology to drive that culture. But you also need that mindset, and that comes in with communication. I think leadership driving that mindset, and then technology gives you the, the skills, the tools to, to be able to do that. So you combine efficiency, productivity in all areas. All of that, of yeah, into one, yep. <laughs> David. Uh, yeah, so within cultural transformation, uh, we're focused around you know data and imparting that as a cultural change element. Um, so uh, you know, as I can mention here, a lot of OKRs and metrics are around supporting that, the, not just the, the quantifiable, uh, but the qualitative. So we're always surveying. So we have this feedback loop to make sure that the tools that we're putting out there are being used and utilized. And a good example of this is before we set settled on our current uh, uh, BI platform, we had gone through four separate BI platforms. And we could have just pushed it through and said, this is it, this is what you're gonna use. But we had, for lack of a less colorful way of describing it, systemic rejection from our stakeholders. There was some early adopters that were gung-ho about it, but there was a lot of issues along the way with you know, how to use the platform, the data it was providing, um, and just the sheer size of our data. So we had, we had iterated through that until we had found kind of a hybrid strategy um, that I was talking about earlier that really worked for our stakeholders. So I think it's, you know, it's not just about dictating the strategy, it's about working collectively with your partners to really find out what they're actually gonna use. Because you can have the best data out there and be able to provide the greatest insights, but if they don't trust you and if you're not working with it, with them, and they're not adopting and using it, it's never gonna like lead to impactful change and uh, hopefully aligning with the business objectives. Do you really leverage that option to have stakeholder buy-in and to get them also, let's say, they help you convince everybody to make it happen? Yeah, it's, uh, it's super important to, to getting success across the board. Great. Yeah. Good, then let's move into uh, business value framework topic. So it would be good to understand now to, and to learn if you have had a business value framework in use uh, and if you can share um, some decisions you have made uh, <coughs> or learnings you had also had in this. Maybe we start this time also with you, David. Uh, yeah, so I would say that, you know, I spoke a little bit about like the qualitative and quantitative uh, engagement metrics there. That really aligns around the business framework here um, and the goals that we have in place. So 
um, it's, it's key to what we have. And as I mentioned earlier, I think it's, it's super helpful if you can understand your, your customer's goals and bring those in as goals on your own, right? So that way your team, you know, has this intimacy with the objective that they're trying to solve. It also really helps in, in being able to come constructively with uh, like consultative suggestions. So especially when you're, when you're reaching into generative AI and, um, and other data technology advancements that are out there that you can start to like, you know, understand the relevancy of these towards your customer's goals. Uh, and to bring those constructively to really amplify success. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, yeah. Krista. So that's a good question. We, we conducted a sentiment survey before we moved on to Google Workspace to try to understand um, tools that our t users were using, how they were using them, and then their comfort level with Google before we moved. We also did a lot of uh, persona inventory. So we went through the organization and looked at different roles throughout the organization. How do they use the technologies we were using at the time? How often do they use them? In what way do they use them? And that drove a lot of the strategy around training at the implementation. And it's something that we refer to frequently now. The sentiment survey that we do, we conducted prior to implementation and we do it quarterly now. That really has driven a lot of our strategy around ongoing training. So how, what's the sentiment overall? Are people able to do their job with the new tools that we've implemented? What's their comfort level with them? And then we also allow them to give uh, just comments. So we're able to go back and look at those comments and say, are we seeing trends here? Um, what education do we need to do? So we've set up different training curriculum to try to address some of those questions and concerns. We do a weekly newsletter. We found different forums to share new features and functions that are coming, but also what are those common questions that we're getting into our help desk or our team? What are those common areas of concern? We were one of the first Google clients to use announcement spaces in chat. And so we set up one of those where we just show tips and tricks. Again, what are some common questions or issues that are coming in or what's a new feature? And then we link out to more data on it. So we're trying to really push out what are the new features that are coming out? How do we see them helping our staff? And and then giving them resources to then go from, whether it's a Google provided uh, blog post or tip sheets that we create internally. So that's a lot of driven off of that s survey that we do, really just trying to understand again, is it just a lack of awareness, which in some cases it is, or is it they're just not aware of the new features, right? Or is it something that's inherent in Google that they just don't know? Is it common trends you see people struggling to adopt a different way of thinking where Google is so search focused. So trying to get people to change, especially in Gmail, their way of using an email system and finding emails. So is it, is it a matter of just changing those behaviors and getting people to adopt? Or is it new features and functions that we think can help people? We just need to get it out to, again, a large population. How long did it take to do this survey? The survey, we usually have it open for a couple weeks, is that what you're asking? So we do it quarterly. We don't do it to the whole organization, we do it to a representative sample. Oh. So we pull clinical and non-clinical people, people in leadership, non-leadership, all across the board. So all different roles, all different divisions, again, we're across the country, so we pull people from all different divisions. It's one of the things we watch closely to make sure yeah. we're getting good clinical and non-clinical representation and from all of our different markets across the country. And then we usually leave it open for two to three weeks to get responses. And again, we do that quarterly. Talita, okay. what would you share here? Is it also, you did surveys to learn and find out more or did you have another practice to do this? So <clears throat> I'll, I'll break it down, I think. Um, there's one element, I think, of the strategy is Transformation is hard, and when you talk about transformation all the time, it wears people out. Yeah. Um, I mean, now we're talking about AI, but before it was digital transformation, digital transformation, um, all the time. And so I think the first part of the strategy was um, going from a place of transformation to a place of evolution, right? So we're not transforming, we're evolving. And the, the benefit with that is it's not a matter of a, a project, right? It's not a matter of a one-time thing, but you're always evolving, right? And so it's a lot easier to continue to um, 
change uh, functionalities, to change things that you're doing because you have a speech that's talking about continuous growth and not one shot, painful, et cetera. So I, th I think that was the first part. Um, when we look at evolution, what started out really as collaboration um, eventually became successful. So we had uh, surveys that we roll out similar to, to what she said about we do it twice a year. We also monitor Google and some of the other tools that we use, their NPS. So um, that's a good way for us to kind of see what people like, what they don't like. Um, but then after you do all that, and if you're successful, people collaborate, right? And so we had a moment last year where um, our senior leadership said, you wanted to implement tools because you wanted to drive collaboration behavior. The, the, the research says you have that. We, we think we have that, everyone thinks we have that, so why do you need this tool now? What's next? And so that's when we actually went to the next step of the evolution, which we believe is productivity. So there's a big push for productivity now. I think everyone's talking about it. Um, and what we found is we've started this implementation maybe about two years ago, is there's so much legacy, right? So you have these little, what I call them little Excel monsters, where you have, you know, like 50, 60 spreadsheets tied together in what should really be kind of the software, um, yeah, and macros, yeah. and what should really be development, and processes that are kind of sewn together, but have never really been thought out if the way that they're being done is the most efficient way possible, right? It's just people building on things um, throughout the years, and that's especially true when you have hyper growth like we have. Um, and so now we're at a place where we've mapped all of these kinds of circumstances. So we rolled this out to the entire organization, about 10,000 people in corporate, and said, what are your little monsters that you have, right? If I turn this off, what, what will break? And we mapped all that and we um, ran kind of um, a, a survey for each of them specifically. We had about 500, 570 of these um, to see how much time and resources people were using for each of them. And then what is the solution for that to make pe people's life easier? So a lot of the times and most of the times it's not going from um, you know, Excel to Sheets. It's going from so much more, you know, being app sheet, yeah. develop, tech development, um, revisiting the whole process. Sometimes you don't even need that process in the first place. So it's not a one-to-one um, -one solution, right? There's so many things that you could do with that. And we work really close with our data team too, because a lot of that solution has to do with better access to data, connecting data, et cetera. Um, and so with that, we're actually able to calculate, met metrify how much time we're saving and how much value we're actually adding to the business. So if I have a process that used to take me 50 hours a week and now it takes me two, that's added value. And so that's currently the business framework that we're using now, having gone through communication, collaboration, and now in productivity, um, is actually using tools as a way to map inefficiencies and using tools to correct inefficiencies. So by killing the monsters, you also saved time and used this as a measurement to prove the success. Exactly. Okay. Not just the monsters. You sum, yeah, you, you summarize that well. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Then let's move on to the, um, to the next topic. So um, when we talk about, let's say, yeah, change, uh, process, culture, and business impact, um, any anecdotes or stories that, uh, that you can share here? Uh, maybe we start with you again. Oh, so many war stories, I think. <laughs> it's hard, transformation is hard. Um, but I think at the, the end of the day, some of the stories that, that I like most um, is kind of reading the feedback that people give. So, you know, anonymously people write craziest things and um, there was one particular feedback that I read maybe about six months ago that this person said, I feel like I'm an intern again. You changed the tools that I work with 
and I feel like I have to learn how to do my job all over again. And I'm like, exactly, that's exactly what we want you to do. You killed, you killed, you killed the monster of this person, it, which may caused the problem. It, exactly, and so, um, and you know, I didn't know who that was, um, <laughs> of course, um, but you know, this like three paragraphs of writing about how this was difficult to this person and how their life became so hard after this. And um, last week, actually, we were at a conference for, for something else, and this person who is now on one of the one of the teams that works really closely with us in culture, she came up to me and she's like, I don't know if you read feedback, but I wrote about six months ago <laughs> this piece of feedback that I felt like I was an intern again. And I just wanted to thank you for that because today I do things so much differently. And, and an example that she gave was I used to have, you know, files that I would say version 65 of the file and send it back and then it wasn't updated and then I had to update it again. And now everyone works collaboratively, everyone works together. I use less time to do the things that I needed to do. Um, and so thank you for, for everything. I was, you know, I complained a lot, but I, I understand now all that we're doing. And so I think for me, that was so rewarding <laughs> because you read all of this and you're like, are we, is, does this even make sense what we're doing? And then when you kind of get that feedback, when you listen to that live, yeah. that's, that's my favorite story I think so far. So the change was, of course, a question mark or a challenge in the beginning, but then after adopting it, getting used to it, they saw or she saw the value that it's that it's a good process, right? Exactly, and I yeah. think change is painful, right? I mean, yeah. you go, you, you're a child, and then you learn to walk, and you fall down all the time, and then you become a teenager, yeah. and you grow, and I think um, you, you have to tell people that. You have to be honest that it's going to be painful, but it's going to be better at the end. And I think a lot of the times when transformation doesn't work, it's when you, 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 you're not honest with people about that, right? And you try to you know, do all of these things to make everything best possible. And yeah, you have to do that. But there, if, you wanna, if you want people to change, then there has to be rupture and rupture is painful. And so I think just having that communication and that honesty with people, um, that it is an evolution journey, um, you know, no matter what tool you implement, I think is really powerful. Yeah. Chris, what, what aha moments or let's say stories did, can you share here with this in, in that sense? You also had some, some tougher feedbacks and responses that made you <laughs> think differently or that stayed in your mind for a long time until you found out who it was? Oh, I mean, the list of fun feedback just goes on and on. <laughs> what, one thing I have loved, though, is through these sentiment surveys and the comments people put is that evolution of we have to go back to the legacies, like you have to get rid of Google. Why did we go to go, go back, go back, go back? Now I'm seeing the evolution of please don't make us go back. Please don't take this away, <laughs> right? Now that they've had that mind change, now that their muscle memory has changed from the old way to the new way, and that's the tricky part that you mentioned where, you know, now I have to think about how to do it, whereas before it was just rote. I didn't have to think. I could just do, the, do my work, and now I have to think about, oh, how do I do that? How do I do that in this system? Once they get past that and the new muscle memory is there, the new way, yeah. now they're saying, don't go back, please don't take this away. Um, one of the things that we did was set up a center of excellence. And the idea was when you're making a transition like this, there's some things that are a little bit simpler, um, yeah. kind of straight across functionality. So it's, okay, I did it this way here, I did it this way here, it's <coughs> easy. But there are some workflows or complex team structures that required a little bit more handholding. And so we set up the center of excellence as a way to, to really give specialized attention to those more complex processes and workflows, uh, work more closely with them on, okay, here's how the tools can help you. We might need to do some development as well, it may not be straight across. But I think the idea of cultural transformation, it's not can we replicate what you had? If you can do that, you're effective, right? We can effectively move you from here to here and you can still do your job. But if we're doing it right, we're actually making it better. We're not doing a one for one. We're not just matching up, here's how you did and here's how you're going. If you're gonna transform, you've gotta find a better way of doing it. So I think finding tools, finding ways to help people get beyond, that's when you really are successful at redoing that muscle memory, getting people to adopt it and and now begging you please don't take this away like I can't imagine going back to the old way right I'm not at the begging yet but I hopefully will get <laughs> 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 
So how long was that time until you, you reached that moment that uh, when the first one says, please, can we keep this, don't take it away? Should I admit that? I mean, we've been on just over two years, but I, we've had those comments for probably a year now, but I'm seeing an uptick. So if you're new in your transformation, yeah. don't panic. It may not take you two years, but yeah, we're at about two and a half years. And I'm again, I've seen them before, but I'm starting to see more, which is great. David. So um, the survey is an interesting point there. I wanted to just kind of dovetail on um, some of the uh, uh, customers that you've had leave very lengthy or passionate um, uh, uh, comments there. Those, I actually, I'll, I'll share this with you guys, like those are the kind of customers that I gravitate towards um, because those are customers that were very invested in the relationship and that's why they're getting very vocal with their commentary. I'm, I'm more scared about the ones that don't say anything when you make holistic changes. And, and to be honest, there's times that you're gonna have to make changes, right? You might, you know, leave a vendor or the pricing might dictate it or yeah. something else organizationally happens. But it's super important to listen to those customers even though they're, the, kind of the toxicity of their comments seems grating or offensive. Um, but if you can listen to them and, under, and, and gravitate to what their, con what their concern is and be able to win them over, then they'll become like evangelists for you. Um, and they'll help you to sell the transformation that you ultimately need to make. Um, so don't, don't discount them because they're, they're super important. They often, their sentiment is reflected by a lot of people who are just like, have kind of given up and, or don't feel like they're comfortable sharing their opinion or whatnot. So that's a super important thing. Um, and as far as, you know, uh, with, with the organizational changes that we've made, um, I'm, I'm so proud that, you know, my whole organization are the ones who are like kind of leading the change and they're out there winning over audiences and, and helping them to make the data change uh, going forward. So. Um, yeah, I think we're in a, we're in a, a really uh, great place right now. But yeah, don't lose sight of those kind of those squeaky wheels. You know, go over there and oil them, and um, just they'll help. Yeah, maximize on the passion, right? Yeah, all that's telling you is that they're passionate. Yeah, and so if you can get that pointed in the right direction, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Embrace the screamers. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Uh, uh. Um, so um, another good point is now, what, what advice would you give uh, other leaders, maybe we continue with you, David, uh, at that kind of, at that point of stage when they are starting into a transformation? Yeah, I, I would say the, the key thing is, is don't like, don't dictate change to them, right? You wanna, you wanna understand their goal and have them um, feel comfortable that you understand their goals and pain points. And um, so make sure you're, you're, you're having an open and candid and uh, constructive conversation with them. Um, making, you know, make sure that you like circulate your proposal with them um, and get their feedback. There, there are gonna be times, I'll be flat out honest, where you have to push forward on something and they might be resistant to change. Uh, then you have to go put your sales hat on and, and, and really work on leveraging that. Um, but um, those are those are the kind of the, what I would say is, is the important thing. It's like bring them along, make sure they're active stakeholders in the transformation, uh, and then really work on showcasing the value that this will bring to them. Um, you know, like generative AI, I think is a, is a prime example. A lot of people get scared or they don't understand what it's, and we're gonna oh, yeah. move to this in a little bit here, which I'm super excited about. But you know, people get scared or they don't understand like how this can bring transformation. And that's, that's like a huge unlock for them, yeah. uh, as well as a lot of other AI and a lot of other technology, so. Thanks. Yeah. Teresa. I, I think it goes without saying that you need top-down leadership. That's kind of Great. common. One thing I see though, in multiple organizations I've worked with is, even if you get top-down leadership, sometimes partway down it breaks down. So we have excellent support from our CEO, CIO, CTO, they're all on board, but somewhere down in the organizational structure you find that squeaky wheel that we haven't converted yet. Um, you find somewhere where there's a roadblock. So I think making sure you've got that leadership structure that's pushing the why, mm -hmm. helping them understand why are we doing this, what's the advantage to you, but also giving a forum when you've got leaders that 
are having a hard time selling this to their staff, giving them somewhere else to go voice that. Don't voice that to your staff, because it's gonna be that much harder for you to get them on board later, but give them somewhere, like you were saying, where can they go to communicate and be heard um, and have those concerns addressed, because you do need that leadership, and it's not just at the top, although that's imperative, but it's all the way down through the organization. Yeah. Anyone that's in a leadership role needs to be able to verbalize the concerns, need to have them addressed, and have that mind and heart shift so they can help get buy-in from their folks. Because like we said, change is hard, right? No one, yes. very few people jump on board and say, yes, please totally disrupt the way I work. <laughs> um, so I, I think, again, top down, but where does it break down and find yeah. those pockets and address them? I don't think I have that much that's new to, to what they said, but I think top-down leadership is important. Um, you can't really go anywhere without that. Um, I think also kind of bottom-up support. So we created a, an ambassadors program and actually we had several challenges for people to go out, try new things, um, have specific trainings, be, be promoters really within the organization and actually the final reward uh, for these ambassadors um, was a trip here. So they're actually in our audience. Um, and so that really, made something that originally was difficult and, yeah. and laborious um, really exciting. You know, I, I had people like, I want to be an ambassador now, you know, this seems this seems cool. So I think you, you really need it at the top, but having it at the bottom really kind of creates this excitement and this buzz that can really push you forward. So I think that's definitely something that we did. And um, just, just building off of what they said to the last point is have a really clear why and also a really clear definition of success. And so, um, you know, when the decision ultimately to change over was before I joined the company. So there was, there was, I wasn't part of that, but when I joined the project, I said, you know, collaboration is great, but what do we mean with that? What do we actually want people to yeah. be doing? We want productivity. What does that actually mean? We want to change how people work. Okay. What are they doing now that they should be doing differently? And I think you need to have that kind of two or three layer deep conversation with people or else it becomes a very superficial conversation about you. Oh, you, you know, you're part of the tech team and you want to change my tools because of X, Y, Z and not some of the more structural, cultural things that you actually want. And so I think that's really important. And also having, like I said earlier, on, I mean, optimism with honesty, I think, is really my go-to. So you need to be optimistic that it's going to work, that it's going to get better, but you also need to be honest about um, about what's going to happen, about the challenges with your team and, and with other teams, too. And I think those two things are really important, I guess, more for who's running the, the transformation um, to kind of keep going, not lose optimism, but also understanding that honesty with your stakeholders and honesty with everyone who's going through this hard process process um, is important. Good, then let's uh, move into uh, a very special topic, AI. I think some people have heard <laughs> about AI in the last uh, uh, one and a half days. So um, let's think a bit ahead and uh, yeah, I would like to know what you think about AI, how will it change productivity? And maybe we, just, we, we start with, with David here because you were part of the Trusted Tester program with Forbes. You had the chance to get access already. Yeah. Uh, would be good to hear impacts, outcomes, how did it change, feedbacks, and uh, yeah. also negative sides if, if, if there were some. It's always good to get honest answers and stories and learning. No, there wasn't. Uh, so let me just get the negatives out of the way here first. So, <laughs> so yeah, we, we've been we've we've been fortunate to be able to play with with Duet AI within Workspace here for I think three uh, two or three months here. Yeah. Um, the negative is is that I think once you realize what it can bring, you're like, well, they should, why don't they have this feature in here? And so that was uh, that that would be the negative. I think if you start to get an appetite for. Uh, you know, just that the possibilities with generative AI. Um, the the experience has been very fun for us. Uh, the slides, the images, um, that I can tell you personally, like when you're going through and creating slide decks and you're looking for images and you gotta go out there and scour Google looking for like the right image, you know, that, that uh, as much as much fun as it is, it takes a lot of time. So to to quickly have uh, the the uh, the duet come back with like really good images for decks is is like great. 
Um, and um, th but there's, there's a lot of other great features in there as well. Um, we, I'm gonna go a little bit off piece here, but I'm gonna say that like, if you use BigQuery to drive uh, Google Sheets, and in turn, like you can ingest that into Google Slides, you can start to use uh, large language models. I think that was just announced at the conference here. So you can connect all the way down into that, which it gives you a great degree of flexibility, uh, which we have been working with for a little while here, but that's another uh, an opportunity there. But from the context of Do It, uh, it's, it's been something that the team has been super excited about. And uh, I, um, we're looking forward to, to more with that, and it's been a huge labor saver for us. So That's good to hear. Thanks yeah. for sharing this. Chris, what do you think? How will Gen AI change your organization? It's an interesting question when you try to talk about AI and healthcare, but I'm gonna set that part aside <laughs> because I think that's a loaded question. But I will say from an operations or administrative perspective, an analogy with healthcare is any clinician will tell you they wanna spend more time focused on the patient than they do on the computer. And I would say the same thing from an administrative or operational perspective. The less time I have to spend farming data, creating slides, whatever, <coughs> is the more time I can spend on strategizing, analyzing business, looking for opportunities for improvement. So saving time doing what I would consider clerical stuff, making slides, even just farming the data, the presentation yesterday about being able to farm from all of our different files and emails to get a summary of the data we need, like that's huge to me. Like I hate wasting time tracking down information in 20 different places, even if we're doing it effectively, it's still in multiple different places. So the less time I spend doing that, the more time I spend in the data, in the information, looking at ways to strategize, looking at ways to improve, to your point about productivity, that's just gonna help any company. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you think? Um, I think everyone is really excited um, about it. Uh, we're excited too. Um, and I, the thing that kind of comes to mind um, when we think about it is, as much to your point, you know, how do we um, spend less time on this shallow work? I guess I'll call I'll call it uh, versus the deep work where we actually get productivity, where we create insights and so forth. Um, there was an, uh, an article in, in Harvard Business Review, I think last year, that the average employee spends four hours just switching between things, right? Yeah. And, you know, if you work 40 hour a week, like four hours in a week, that's a lot of time. Um, and so I think that AI has the potential to really help decrease this time by being able to connect everything together. Um, because, you know, most of the time you have to put in, um, you know, create a presentation because you need to make a business decision and then you spend, I don't know how much time in drive and then you go and you're online and you're searching and you're communicating and, and, and that's really like laborious. Um, so I think it really has the potential to drive productivity. But I will say I do have concerns um, that aren't, you know, typical concerns, but more so about the how this impacts people's behavior, right? Because at the end of the day, you want tools to drive behavior and the behavior that you're looking for is for people to actually critically think about things and not just do. What happens when you make it so much easier to just do? right? You, you actually have an incentive to not really critically think about the processes because it's so much faster now, right? And so it's something that we talk a lot about um, on our team, which is what do you automate now to gain efficiency now versus what do you redesign as a process to get it later? Because it's a trade-off, right? Some things make sense for you to automate the process, even if it's not the most efficient possible versus other things that are more structural, maybe not. Um, but I do have this concern with AI, what, how is it going to impact the way that people critically think about their work journeys? Are they simply going to do things faster or are they actually going to do things different? <laughs> Good, thank you. Yeah, with that said, um, we are closing it out today and I have to say thank you very much for joining us today. Small applause, please. And, uh, I'm sure it's uh, an easy thing if somebody has additional questions to reach out to you in the next couple of minutes around here or throughout today or tomorrow. Thanks again Thanks and enjoy so the rest of the show uh, here at Cloud Next. Thank you.